I'd like to share some thoughts about the idea of predictive coding in the brain and its relationship to magical practice. I'm inspired by an article I read on the subject which um, compares the predictive coding concept of how we, the brain builds our sense of reality, our sense of being, with some of the magical techniques, in particular the Golden Dawn um, path workings, the relationship between imagination and magical practice. But these are my own thoughts on this subject. Um, predictive coding, how do I explain that? Well, let's take this example. I'm going to assume that you're sitting in front of a computer looking at me talking on the computer screen. Now, there's actually two realities in front of you here, aren't there? There's um, the image of me and the reality of the computer in front of you. That's how we normally think of it. In other words, you reach out to touch me and um, uh, <laughs> you don't touch me, you touch a glass screen, you know. I don't react with a, a shock of being touched. Um, on the other hand, uh, the computer, you can reach out, you can touch it, you can interact with it, you can feel the edges um, and you can hear the keys clicking on whatever. And so um, it's very natural to say there's a difference between the image of me and the reality of the computer. Now actually, our scientific worldview um, says that isn't actually quite right. Both are images because you see the experience of the image of me and the experience of the computer is all done inside the brain. It's actually sort of coded, it's modeled inside the brain. That's what you're actually experiencing. And um, if you say, I don't believe that, well, we could get a hypnotist. You might be on the beach somewhere outside, nowhere near a computer, and a clever hypnotist might be able to hypnotize you to be convinced that actually you're sitting at a computer watching an image of me on a screen. He could build that model in your brain. So, say from a sort of scientific point of view, uh, everything we experience is images inside the brain. And the question is, is how those images are produced. Now the um, traditional idea that I was taught, that I brought up, was that well, we have all this sensory, sensory input that comes from touch, smell, feeling, sound, um, sense of space, and that the brain uses that sensory input to build up a sort of model of what's happening, and that is what we're experiencing. And, um, but the, a more recent view says, no, it's done predictively. The brain actually invents that model um, inside you based on what is probable, most probable. And, okay, what if it makes a mistake in the invention? Well, then the senses or some other thing else can correct it. Um, uh, now, this actually sort of makes sense to me because if you just imagine two primitive life forms and um, one of them creates its model by taking in all the information from the senses, and in a fraction of a second, it builds up this model of what's around. Whereas the other one has already created a model of most likely to give it its feeling of being in space and its body ready for motion. That entire is all part of the model. Then that second one would have a tactical advantage if they were competing. Because while the first one still for a second and a second is, is, is building up the model, the other one's already got a model and is ready to act. Now it might be possibly um, have got it wrong but all it has to do is to um, correct um, what it is seeing. Now, at first I thought it's asking a hell of a lot to um, you know, have a, a probabilistic model and then correct it. Until, um, well in the 80s, my brother um, had a company which was involved with uh, broadcast television and um, coding and, um, you know, standards conversion, things like that. And I said to him, how is it possible that over the same sort of broadcast network, um, we can now transmit high quality color images and a system that was originally set up for just doing 
black and white um, images of a few lines. Because when you think of a big color TV picture in terms of digital pixels on there, there's an enormous amount of data in one image, millions of pixels, and there's the color information. So how can all that transmit? And the answer, of course, is, um, is data compression. What he explained is that if you, even if you take a fast moving thing like a football game and you've got one um, frame and then a fraction of a second later you have another frame and you've got to transmit both of them, what actually changes between those two frames? The fastest moving thing is probably the ball and all it has done is move from one point to a slightly further along. So if all you do is transmit the changes that have happened, you're actually transmitting very little information. Okay, some of the faster runners will have um, shifted their body position slightly. And so there's just a number of pixels change. And in fact, you can be even cleverer than that because in something like the ball, which doesn't change its shape, going from there to there, you only have to put in a vector of its movement. And um, then there may be a, a small correction if it isn't quite right in the next image and so on. So this is the sort of processing which is suggested is going on in the brain and it's happening very, very quickly. I talked about two competing life forms, but imagine this situation. There into the room comes an old friend, good friend, smiles at you warmly and reaches out his hand to shake your hand. And suddenly you notice that he's holding a dagger in his hand and he plunges it into your breast before you can react or respond. Now there's an example where the predictive model actually misleads you. And um, uh, we get examples of this. It's used by crooks and conjurers. Um, so for instance, um, I remember seeing uh, uh, Darren Brown demonstrating how he go up to someone in the street and get into conversation with him, you know, um, can you tell me the way to the Blackpool Tower or something like that. And um, uh, he would hand him a bottle of water he's holding while he gesticulates and the guy sort of takes a bit surprised and then he takes it back, you see. So he's created a sort of expectation of to and fro between them. And then while he's just in the middle of talking about something else, you know, about the railway station or something, he says, pass me your wallet. And the person reaches and hands him the wallet. And then Darren walks away. And you see the person sort of puzzled. Then suddenly he realizes what he'd done. He rushes after him. Um, that's the sort of trick that um, uh, you know crooks can use. They can confuse our expectations. So for a second, you don't actually notice what's happened. And conjurers do a similar thing. You know, there's a um, they may show you a pack of cards and say, you know, uh, nothing ordinary out of the ordinary here. Choose a card. Now, actually, one of the cards is is something wrong. It's like uh, a three of diamonds that's black instead of red. And it's surprising how um, uh, long it can take for people to notice that there's something wrong there. Um, and they can be a little bit confused um, if they try and recall what it is. Now, um, to sort of explain how quickly this can happen, I'm going to use the description of right brain and left brain. Not necessarily saying it, it happens in the right brain or the left brain, you know, that's open question to me, but we understand what we mean when we talk about right brain thinking, which is the very creative, immediate, sort of three-dimensional visual and um, sensation uh, type of thinking, which is used, for instance, by a dancer or an athlete um, to make rapid body movements, a sense of where you are in the space and the space around you. Whereas the left brain works sequentially Typically, language, you see, when I'm speaking, I'm actually speaking in one dimension, um, a series of words which you interpret, and um, uh, logical descriptions, and how these two work together. Now, just to give an idea of how different the speed of these two operations are, imagine this experiment. You're in front of a door in a house that you've not been into before, and I tell you, I'm going to open that door and you've got five seconds to take in the room um, behind that door and then I'll pull you out and shut the door and I'm going to ask you to describe the room. So you, the door is opened, you're pushed in, one little second, two little second, three little second, four little second, five little second, then I pull you out and say, tell me about the room. And you say, uh, 
well, it was sort of large furnished room. Um, uh, it was light. And I say light, uh, you mean um, it had bright lights? No, no, it was, uh, there were two windows bringing in a lot of light. So it's a light room. Well, no, not exactly. It, it, it actually was rather Victorian, you know, it's quite sort of wood panelled and heavy furniture, oak furniture and, you know, carpets, uh, Persian rugs on the floor, that sort of thing. But there was a lot of light coming in, you know. And then you go on explaining it, you know. Um, yes, it was like a dining table, there was silverware on it. And you realise that what you took in in five seconds of quick assessment, actually you could talk about it for ten minutes or more. Um, describing things and even when you use words like it was rather Victorian room that one word captures a whole feeling of a sort of style which is conveyed to me um, so you see the um, what I call the right brain thinking can act very very fast and it can create this sense of the space you're in and what you're doing sitting in front of the computer here's the computer and everything and here your hands ready to move to the keyboard um, predictively and it's only if something goes wrong that um, the left brain comes in to start sort of making corrections. And the first way to correct, obviously, is, is um, touch. You know, um, if uh, I say, well, actually, it isn't the computer you think it is. I've changed it. You know, you look closely. Oh, oh yes, actually, it's a different keyboard. So going back to this room, uh, you're a bit puzzled about why the room was so light. And I ask you about that, you know, the light coming through the window, and you say, <laughs> it's ridiculous, but I had a feeling there was a snow scene outside, very white, very, um, but of course it couldn't be because we were in midsummer. How could that be? And so um, you say, well, you know, was there silver birches or something outside there that would have looked so light? And I say, no, no, there are no silver birches here. In fact, there are elm trees outside the window. So, um, you want to test what's gone wrong. And I'm going to open the door for one second and let you look again at those windows to see what was actually out there. One second, and I shut it. And you say, but it was a snow scene. I looked hard and it was a snow scene. Um, now, what you'd really like to do is go up to the window and open it and stick your head out, but I don't allow you that. It's one second of sensation. Now. That is really confusing. Um, how could, whereas before you said, oh, I must have got it wrong, I must have imagined that. Um, now your senses tell you there is a snow scene out there. And this is when the sort of uh, logical deduction begins to try to correct the picture. Um, now, uh, is this a trick? Am I a hypnotist who has hypnotized you into believing you're looking out of a window of the snow scene? Um, you think about that, you think, oh, no, it doesn't seem to fit very well. Um, is this like a conjuring trick? Those two big windows, were they actually LCD panels, um, bright ones, putting a lot of light into the room and uh, showing a snow scene? You know, was this a conjuring trick I'd arrange? That's the sort of thinking is going into it, because you must correct what was wrong. It's, it's, it's upsetting if you can't understand it. Now, in one of these other talks, I gave an example of when I saw a ghost um, in my early years at, uh, in Cambridge in my rooms. I woke up, sat up, and there was this snarling, angry figure crouched over my bed with a dagger raised. And I could have reacted in a lot of ways. I could have switched on the light or screamed or jumped out of bed or something. But instead, I just kept my head still. I didn't move my eyes and I just stared at it. And it took a few seconds for it to melt into the sort of swirly patterns of the curtain behind. And you see, a rationalist would easily say that, oh, well, you know, your brain had your eyes have misinterpreted those swirly patterns and seen this snarling man and that's what you built in your brain. Now that's a very neat explanation but it didn't quite make sense to me because this process seemed to be a one-way process. You see if like an inkblot test or something you know you look at the inkblot and you say oh it does look like a face of a woman. Um, you can see it as an inkblot and you can see it as a face of a woman you can go between them. 
Remember that uh, classic thing where you've got two silhouetted faces facing each other and uh, in between the white space actually looks like a candlestick between them. Now you can look at that and you can see the two black faces and then you can adjust the thinking and see the candlestick and actually with a bit of practice you can see both. You can move to and fro between them. Now what I was testing you see, as I stared at that is if that was all that was happening and I haven't moved my eyes or my head and the light hasn't changed, I should now be able to recreate that face from the background. You know, I should now see it, the swirly pat again as a face. And I couldn't, I just couldn't make it happen. It had gone completely. And what that told me was that I was engaged in a sort of normalization process. I had made the, um, the mystery normal. And um, when I later read Carlos Castaneda, um, he takes Don Juan out into the desert in dusk of a magical time and Don Juan sees a, a ferocious monster in the dusk rearing up and is terrified, you know, hair standing on end. Um, but he's very proud because he doesn't scream or react or do anything silly. He walks towards it staring hard and he realizes what he's actually seen was a, a, a fallen tree and it had made it into a monster in his mind. And he was proud because he's shown he was level-headed and sensible. But Don Juan ticks him off. He says, no, there was magic there. You destroyed it just to make yourself feel safe. And so that's how I had the idea that um, the brain, um, if it does witness something magical and your um, beliefs are rational, uh, it will do its best to to disintegrate it, you know, normalize it, um, either by actually forcing your senses to review the situation like that, or else in the case of my um, uh, mystery of the uh, snow scene, um, you know, thinking of some explanation like this must be a conjuring trick or I must have been hypnotized or whatever. Now the the thing is when I stared at that thing, I was having the input of senses, but it took a few seconds for it to melt away. Um, this correcting thing, if it has a difficult problem to correct, actually has to work quite hard at it um, to rebuild because it's just working through the senses. It's working through the right brain, uh, left brain's slower sort of um, decision making process. Um, now, the relevance to my magic is. Um, at present, I'm uh, preparing, editing my magical diary for the Abramelin operation of 40 years ago. And I'm. one of the things that puzzles for me is that uh, at the end of it, I didn't see and speak to my guardian angel in the sort of satisfactory, um, sensuous way that I would have hoped, you know. There he is, and um, hello, Lionel, and um, you know the conversation takes place, and so on and so forth. Um, instead, I was faced with a sort of nothingness, a silence, and yet there seemed to be something very significant about that, which worked itself out um, over the next few years. And still 40 years on, I'm still learning things. It really triggered something profound and different. Now, um, I never quite resolved this. You know, to what extent was it a flop? To what extent has actually in its own way had it succeeded? And I'm having to sort of work on this as I, as I write the postscript, you know, what happened after. Now, the thing is, when I look back, that the six months of training I had leading up to that day, I had had the difficulty of how I was going to do this sort of um, theistic uh, process. I mean, the wonderful thing about Abraham it leaves it open. You know, if you're a pagan, uh, do it your way. If you're a um, Christian, do it your way. If you're a Jew, do it that way. But of course, I was actually more like a, a Taoist. I didn't really have a, a personal God at all. And I was a Thelemite. Um, so, you know, having to bend my knees <laughs> it didn't come naturally. And I got round that by acting as if, in the magical sense, I acted as if there was a deity there. But my actual practice was closer to Crowley's um, eight lectures on yoga. I would sit and silence my mind 
That was what I was practicing for six months. I was practicing entering silence, not, um, I wasn't doing this of golden dawn thing of um, practicing visualization until I could get more and more um, solid images visualized, um, nor the um, sort of Tibetan Buddhist thing where, where you, you visualize these very complex deities, all their colors and everything and things they're wearing. I wasn't doing that, I was doing the opposite. Um, and in fact, although there were some strange um, manifestations, mostly like coincidences, but one in particular was actually something that defied physics, I put them aside in the way one was taught in the early yoga books, you know, that these are distractions. It's the silence you've got to go for. So that was what I was training myself towards. And um, sort of, in a way, that makes sense of what happened at the end for me. But it is interesting. Um, uh, and this article uh, takes the example of like the path workings that the Golden Dawn people did. And how they, um, before you do it, you actually build up a certain amount of expectations of that path. You read about it, you read about what you expect, what the colors are, what the entities are, and things like that. And then you do the path working. Now, a rationalist can really dismiss that saying, oh, well, you know, you've just put in all the information and the mind has just put it together to make what it expects. Um, but it's actually more interesting than that when you practice it. Um, in my book of um, you know, how, to see a, how to See Fairies, um, I describe the imaginative act of, if you can't actually get yourself to see fairies or devas, you say, well, if one was there, what would it look like? And your imagination surprisingly quickly comes up with the answer. You know, you don't have to sort of say, uh, 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 two legs, uh, uh, a little red coat, uh, a hat. No, um, what does the deva of that tree look like? And immediately I, I had an impression of what it ought to look like. Now, the interesting thing for me is that which looks like a simple sort of bit of forced imagination actually comes to life. You very quickly look at another tree and you get a different picture. And then you can start to sort of interact with it. And it doesn't just do what's expected. It comes up with surprises and a real sort of communication takes place. And this is how um, uh, sort of clairvoyant things have worked for me. I was never one of those people who could accept um, something sort of you know, an angel standing at the foot of the bed, tapping his feet on the, on the floor, or anything like that. Um, uh, I had to sort of use my imagination. And yet I was rewarded with really valuable um, sort of magical experiences. And uh, so that is what I, I find interesting in this. And I wonder if I had instead spent my six months um, practicing visualization, would I have built up um, a worldview that would have allowed the angel to appear? In a, another talk, I, I said that, I described this, but you see there's two things that the brain does, the, the left brain, to correct the image. One is uses senses in a very extreme way. Suddenly you've seen something miraculous, you're wide awake and you're staring hard. And in a thunder squeak, I call that the great abortionist. That's the hard attention which sort of makes things go away um, and I, I later I described it that's debugging the software of the universe there's been a software bug that's allowed something to happen and consciousness is the progress that, that debugs the universe and makes it the laws work again but there's also this belief what your belief is that what is possible and I related that to the platonic idea you know that this experience we have, this, which is, we're told is built up in the brain, um, this feeling of your physical body and, and the space you're in and what can be done, and the feelings inside your body and the smells and the touch and everything, um, is, Plato said, that's really like the shadows on the back of the cave, on the wall of the cave. This isn't real. It's a fantasy. And if you turn around and see the light coming into the cave and see the real objects which are casting that shadow, then you're seeing the truth. 
And I said that, um, so uh, Plato has sort of added to reality a truth layer, a layer of what you know is the objective truth, what actually can happen. And if your truth layer says, no, you can't see ghosts, um, the brain will, um, first of all, stare hard to see, like I did at that, um, at that ghost, stare hard at it to be absolutely sure it's seeing it. And then um, the next recourse is to say, could this be possible? No, it couldn't be possible. It must be an illusion. And it fades away. And so I suggested that um, in magic, we add another layer. We add a games layer, I called it in my book, um, My Years of Magical Thinking. So that um, the games layer says that you can actually choose from a series of different truths, series of different platonic truths. You know, you might one moment um, think, oh yes, the scientists are right, this is a physical world, that sort of thing. Um, and you could change that to, uh, yes, but this physical world was made by a loving God, you know, um, or uh, there's another dimension. You know, it, in other words, um, with practice, you could build up different truth models and magic is a process where you can shift between them. And um, I just put that forward. It's interesting, this idea of the predictive uh, coding because it says something more interesting than the idea that we're simply building a model based on our senses. It says in a, in a way we're sort of always in the, working in the future. We're working on what the brain thinks is possible, what um, it believes should be around us. We're always a fraction of a second ahead of um, reality. And that actually gives you space for some rather magical thinking.